Hi, I'm Ted Price from Insomniac Games. 27 years ago, the game Doom caused an explosion in our industry. It popularized first-person shooters, and for me personally, it was the impetus to start developing games. On today's Game Maker's Notebook, I got to talk to two leaders from id, Hugo Martin and Marty Stratton. Marty is the studio director for id, and Hugo is the game director for Doom Eternal, the newest chapter in the Doom series. We talk about what it's like to work at id and what it's like to helm one of the most beloved franchises in our industry. Please join us. Welcome to the Game Makers Notebook, a podcast featuring a series of in-depth one-on-one conversations between game makers providing a thoughtful, intimate perspective on the business and craft of interactive entertainment. The Game Makers Notebook is presented by the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences, a member-driven organization dedicated to the recognition and advancement of interactive entertainment. Hey guys, it is great to have you on the show. Thanks for having us. Yes, thank you for having us. And and I have to say that I've I've been really been looking forward to this because I have I am a massive Doom fan. And and usually during these podcasts, I will dive into just firing questions at you guys. And but uh, today I, I want to just give a little preamble because for me, without Doom, I don't know if there would be an Insomniac Games, which is the company that you know I. I work for and, and run. And back in 1993, Doom was a massive inspiration for me and for my partners, Al and Brian Hastings. And the reason that we started making our first game called Disruptor back in 1994 was because of Doom. And I remember distinctly, after we had released Disruptor, we were up at GDC, I think it was 1996, and we were we had this tiny booth and we were recruiting people back then gdc was more of a recruitment fair than anything else and we had a video of disruptor playing on our little cathode ray tv and we're just hoping that people would come by and pay attention to us and john romero walked by with a bunch of other id folks with him and he stopped and he looked at it and he watched the video for about a minute or two and he said that's really cool and then he walked away (laughs) but for me that moment was total validation that what we had done was actually good. And it, it really, for me also kind of justified that we had, we had done it for the right reasons. And that was to, to jump into the first person shooter market and emulate one of our favorite games. So, uh, with that long preamble, I, I would love to talk a little bit about its history and Marty, you joined it in 1997, four years after the original doom was released. Can you kind tell us? <laughs> I was okay. a producer for them uh, at, at Activision. I actually worked at Activision back then, and okay. uh, and and but and then joined officially uh, on site in 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 Texas uh, in two thousand. Got it. Well, but relatively early in the company's history. So oh yeah, definitely. What what was it like at ID back then? Oh my gosh, it was. Uh, I guess the best way. So I, you know, when I started, there was about. Uh, it, like 12 or 13 people in the company. Um, it wasn't, uh, you know, I, I wasn't like the 12 or 13th person people had left since then, uh, or before then, but, uh, you know, but I, I tend to describe it mostly like a garage band, kind of like, I think a lot of development was then mm-hmm. I, you know, I'd started at Activision, um, and spent about five years, uh, working, working there on, on, on the publishing side, just kind of getting, getting my foot in the door in the games industry. And uh, and uh, started working with ID uh, about two years into that um, as their as their producer on the publishing side, kind of coordinating. So you know it was it was crazy to go down there my first time um, and just and and just see the, the the team. It was it was kind of what you see in pictures and and if you remember the you know the old dot plan files, um, the way you know the way everybody the way everybody talked and was it was it was kind of this it was just this. Uh, very free spirited, fun, just garage band, just guys just who wanted to make video games, uh, doing, you know, having fun, having fun doing it. And, uh, and that was even after, you know, that, that was after Quake had released and, and, uh, you know, I, I had gotten on the tail, the tail end of, of like the Quake mission packs and, and then started working with them on Quake too. So they were fairly, you know, fairly well established, relatively speaking, 
uh, by that point. And, and you go you go earlier in the history, which I've heard tons of stories from, you know, from from the guys and, and from Miss Donna or, you know, or Id Mom. Um, it's just, you know, it, it was it was just kids growing up making video games for, for the most part. That's pretty awesome. So has it changed much since then? Oh my gosh, a, a ton. And and we're still changing. <laughs> I think that's the, that's the, you know, that's, that's the goal is to, is to keep adapting. And, and I think that's why, uh, you know, why the companies, uh, you know, stayed, you know, stayed successful, you know, a lot like Insomniac, I'm sure is your, you have your own stories of adapting and changing and, and, uh, and, and doing what's necessary to, uh, to, to not just survive, but be successful. Um, you know, we're, we're obviously much bigger now. Um, not, not huge. I, I still feel like that's probably one of the best parts about it is that relative to, you know, relative to a lot of teams that we compete against, we're, we're still relatively small as far as the number of developers working on, on the game. We don't do a ton of outsourcing, so it's, it's very intimate. Um, you know, you, you get, you get games from, you know, Ubisoft or, you know, even just in our competitive space of shooters, you know, with, with hundreds of developers, maybe even over a thousand or 2000. Um, and, you know, and we're still, uh, uh, an order of magnitude smaller than that. So, um, there's still a garage band, I think mentality. And I think, you know, vibe that exists in the studio. So while we've, we've updated a lot, um, and, and, you know, everything from, you know, the way we approach things creatively and, and that kind of thing to, to how we operate as a, as a, as a, um, you know, subsidiary of, of Zenimax and, you know, our production practices and all that kind of stuff, uh, you know, relative to 25 years ago, we're, we're, we've changed, uh, you know, almost completely, but I think that the core, you know, the core pillars of the company and, and what we're doing and, and the, um, the fun, you know, the, the, the fun that we try to have as the, foundational element of of the studio and the culture and and the games we make um that stuff hasn't changed and and even just the the kind of like the small independent spirit i think that's in the company hasn't hasn't changed too much uh, you know despite us getting getting larger and and having you know 25 years uh, or or more of uh of, of making games well, one thing you mentioned is the disparity between your team size and your competitors. We have the same challenge at Insomniac. And how do you respond if and when team members say, hey, Team X over here has a thousand developers. We have a tenth of that. And I'm not sure how many people you have on teams. Uh, is there is there something that you talk about within the company that gives you an edge over the larger teams? Uh, I think, you know, I mean, Hugo and I tend to tend to address that when we, you know, when we're interviewing people uh, that, that it tends to come up. Um, and I think the thing is, you know, we 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 the, the team as a whole prides itself on on kind of having a, a Navy SEAL mentality. You know, we can we can be better um, being being small and, uh, and and being agile. And I think, you know, when we're talking to people who are coming in and and interviewing, um, particularly if they've come from from a larger team. You know, it's, it's that you're not, you're not, we can't have people at, at id that are just a, or expect to be a, a cog, you know, in this machine. And, and they, you know, it's almost like an assembly line of, of like work just comes into their desk and they do it and they're scheduled for their, you know, their time. And then it moves on to the next person. And it's like, you're, you're really, you know, from day one, when you join id, you're going to have a massive impact on the game. You're, you're going to see your fingerprints all over the game, whether you're, uh, an associate or you're a senior, um, we ask, you know, we ask everybody to make, uh, significant contributions to the, to the product, um, to, to be part of, you know, what is, what is relatively speaking a fairly flat, flat structure. I mean, we're, we're not, uh, Hugo, Hugo is the game director is in meetings with, you know, everybody reviewing stuff constantly. Um, so you get, there's, there's not a, like, I don't think anybody feels like a lot of tears of, of, um, yeah, a lot of transparency. Yeah. A lot of transparency. And, and I think, you know, they, they, they really get a sense of, of like, you know, I'm connected to this game in, in a very meaningful way and all the way up, you know, you know, whether it's to their lead or to, to, to Hugo or to the production team, it's a very intimate, very connected, um, uh, way of making games. And I think that's, you know, I think that's, you, you, you have to want that if you, if you come to it, you, you, you can't, and, and people struggle when they, when they don't have that mentality. 
Yeah, if you want people to have to be proactive, you know, when we say it's like we'd rather have a group of 12, th that 12 Navy SEALs could do the work of 50, you know, regular soldiers, like, and um, that allows us to remain small, but be really efficient, uh, very little wasted movement. And then, um, but if you want people to be part, part of that is, uh, you know, you, I would imagine a Navy SEAL as being someone who's proactive and self-sufficient and, uh, in order for them to do that, they need a level of, uh, visibility into the, all of the goals of the studio, the, the 50,000 foot goals of the studio as a whole versus the smaller individual goals at a high level with a in particular feature. So we as leaders try to provide them with uh, that visibility so they could be really effective uh, in their in their jobs here as as Navy SEALs, as, as it employees. I think it's really fun. I mean, as a res that's I came to it because that's how I like to be, you know, and I think we attract people who like that, uh, that type of environment. Um, so and Hugo, it's, it's working since you really came good. from the mainstream entertainment industry, did you see the opposite occurring in, I mean, I know you've worked in both and all over the place, but I, I notably having worked with, uh, Guerrero del Toro, Toro and Pacific Rim, did you see, uh, less transparency outside of, of our uh, industry? It varies, but I always felt that the best leaders were really transparent, you know, at least the, for the people that I worked for, you know, um, and, uh, sometimes I think if it gets, if it gets, uh, depending on what you're working on. Yeah. I, I definitely had moments. Uh, I think we all have, you know, where we, uh, the, Oh, that's good to know, you know, <laughs> like those moments where like you, you get the feedback and you realize the thing you worked on was, uh, way off because now you get a chunk of feedback that you weren't aware of before, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, so I've definitely, I think every creative person, regardless of your position has had the good to know moment. So we, uh, yeah, we try to, we try to avoid that as best we can. And I think it makes people feel ge it's genuine. I mean, it, we need it. We need it. It's not a, it's not for show. And, uh, also I think that leads to the employees, uh, feeling that they're truly part of a team that we're all really invested, you know? Yeah. That's it. Well, I mean, let's, let's talk about your most recent, uh, masterpiece and that's doom eternal. And I, I will tell you, we have a lot of serious doom fans at insomniac and, uh, one of our core programmers, whose name is Jack Beltry, uh, loves to use doom imagery on our zoom calls. Cause we're all on zoom all the time now. And the <laughs> other day he was wearing a zoom slayer helmet, uh, for the entire zoom call and just to, just to <laughs> profess his love and dedication to the zoom franchise. I started to the doom franchise. So, uh, that's I, awesome. I, yeah. And, and congratulations on the game. And I, I want to ask, did anything surprise you about the response to the game? Not, not really. Uh, we believed in it, you know, uh, but then we were always, as I'm sure you guys are. And by the way, like we're all huge fans of your games, uh, big time. There's a, actually one of your first games. I wanted to mention this Spyro, uh, was designed by one of my teachers, Charles Ambellis who I studied with in Los Angeles. He's an amazing teacher. He runs the Animation Academy. And uh, he, he has some preliminary sketches of Spyro that, that he did. Uh, well, at least he said he did. I hope I'm not making myself look stupid. He, he well, did. no, he never no. worked on it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, Charles is, a, Charles is a great guy. We He came on board. He was working as uh, an illustrator, and we were fit, trying to figure out who this character was and what he looked like. And Charles w went through hundreds and hundreds of sketches to help us craft Spyro into the little character he is today. Yeah. I just, he, we're all huge fans of your games too. So we appreciate the, the respect is mutual for sure. The, and I played the, the, the crap out of Spider-Man. I must tell you the, um, the, the, um, so yeah, I mean, I think we, we believed in the game and, and, and there was a time where we, you know, we didn't, uh, you know, objectively looked at it and said, it's not where it needs to be. So when it finally got there, uh, I think the the devs are usually a, a a a slice of what you'll see out in the wild, as we like to say. You know, like mm. and, and and it's been pretty consistent. You know, there there was the initial grumbling from some people about some of the design decisions when you know when they're forty five minutes into the experience. Hey, I'm running out of ammo. You know, man, guys are really hard. You know, like, but but then you you kind of have to, you know, okay, we'll keep playing. And so we saw that, you know, with the audience, like. 
it was really uh, well received. And then some of some of the design features uh, that challenged people a little bit more certainly had that with social media. You you're, you hear a play by play, uh, you know, sort of shoutcasting of of as they go through your product, you know, through the experience you've crafted. So it's it's uh you know they they jump on in the first hour. I don't know who thought this, and then the second hour. Well, yeah, I got to be honest. I'm coming around to this, you know, like, <laughs> and third hour. Th- this is amazing, you know. Um, so th- th- that which is kind of interesting. Uh, to, but it, I love it as a creator. I'm sure you do too. Like, it's so easy now to get feedback. It's it's just a piece of cake, you know. Well, um, it, that is true, but. But during during the design process, you are often jumping off of cliff, right? And and hoping that you, your parachute's going to open before you hit the the ground. So, what were some of the design decisions that you did uh, discuss heatedly, if if you did at it? Oh my God, so many! I think the biggest thing was the 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 idea that you could challenge players, you know, and that that in in fact that's what they wanted, you know, and that even you know, air quotes, easier games are not actually easy. Like nothing worth uh, your time is not going to come with a certain level of frustration. That frustration is a part of engagement and that owning that because it's scary to say, give us $60 and we're going to frustrate you sometimes, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, but that's, that's actually part of it. So we, and convincing people of that because like, you get minute by minute feedback, like, which nothing should be judged that way. You know, my first jujitsu class, d- don't ask me what I think of jujitsu in its entirety after one class or one chess lesson, you know, like, because how I feel about it over time is going to change. And um, so you get that, that there's a part of the, the user research process, both internally and externally, when you do an official UR test versus just having dev test, it's that like, game development becomes an exercise in smoothing out the frustration points, which is partially true, but also largely uh, incorrect because I don't want people to, I, I, I argue against the, the frustration button where like, well, you know, there's this thing that they have where like, when you feel something, you hit a button. I'm like, that's awful. You know, like, (laughs) again, I'll use the jujitsu analogy. It's like, don't, don't give me a button to hit every time I I get submitted in my first week of jujitsu. Like I'll hit that thing constantly, you know, and don't ask me what I think, you know, like the, I I mean, ask me what I think because there's something to take from that in terms of smoothing out the experience and how to get you to be, as we say, a black belt. Um, And we use a lot of analogies here, but the, the, um, but to change the final result, just because the first 30 minutes, you had a feeling about something, you're never really going to arrive at anything. You, that, that is a path to making something extremely compromised, you know? And um, we really wanted, we know that the things that stand out are the things that are bold. Uh, creatively speaking, most of the innovations in the arts, whether it's movies or film or, or music, you know, a lot of them come from, you know, indie indie places where people basically are free to make the kind of bold choices that usually stand out. Now, that's not to say that every great, you know, only the good stuff comes from India. That's not true at all. But the, the, um, a game like PUBG where somebody just sits down and on paper, I think a lot of studios, we have laughed internally, like imagine pitching this internally before it came out, you know, one death you, and somebody would be like, dude, are you, so you're telling me that I could spend 30 minutes gathering up all this stuff and then get shot by somebody who's been crouching in a bush for 30 minutes. Before I've even fired a shot. (laughs) Before I've even fired a shot. And then I have to go all the way back to the beginning. Like, and then the designer would be like, yes. You know, they'd be like, no, we're not, we're not making that, you know, like, but so they, but they were able to do it because the highs were so good. And again, they were focused on the end goal. And, and um, so we, generally speaking, eternal, Uh, is making some bold choices. And I I said this in a lot of interviews because I was kind of preparing the audience. It's like frustration is is part of the engagement loop. And the power fantasy earned is far more satisfying than the one that is handed to you. And, you know, it is climbing a mountain. You know, I, I, when you get to the top of that thing and you plant that flag, you know that you got there. You, you, you truly mastered the experience as opposed to taking an elevator to the top. You know, that's just, I, I don't think you're going to get to the top of that and be as stoked. 
So, and then when you reach the top of that mountain, you're more likely to scream to everyone, A, that look at me, I got to the top, B, you got to do it too, you know? And, and there are, then within that, we just have to make sure that the journey up that mountain is fair. That's it. Like if the, if I died because of something I know I did wrong, I accept that. If I died because the game screwed me, that's not fair. That's not okay. So it definitely stress tests all of the systems in the in the studio, you know, making sure that everything performs correctly, that your gear doesn't fail you, you know. Um, and so along the way, people, uh, we actually have like this engagement graph that we worked out where it was showing that like when people hit the bottom of the experience, it's it's basically learning time. Like they, they, they die to the carcass. God damn it. The carcass just made me die because he spawned the shield in front of my face or, you know, whatever, whatever we do. I ran out of ammo and I died. That's the frustration point. And then right there, they look up and that's when they start learning and engagement follows uh, frustration. And we really kind of science that out because uh, not only because it was important for us to understand it, but it's also, we knew that that we needed to sell that to everyone who play tested this during development because it it was just going to keep coming up. Like I would get people running up to me and be like, dude, I just died because I ran out of ammo. And I'm like, I know. So keep playing, you know, <laughs> like that there's, there's a point to all this. Um, so yeah, that was probably, and Marty probably has uh, also a million more, but that was, that was a, that was a big one. And, and honestly, I think we're just happy that, uh, it's amazing to have the support of uh, our our publisher as well to be able to to, to make these kind of bold uh, choices. The, I guess at the end, though, I will say you can only make that argument during development for so long, so long as when people start getting to the top of the mountain and achieving levels of mastery and working their way up that they do feel it's satisfying. You know what I mean? If you're just frustrating me, then I master it. And I'm like, I got to be honest, I'm still annoyed. You know, like, I don't really care. And well, that, that's, yeah, I was going to make that point, that, that exact point, because that's, I mean, you mentioned like, do you, you know, that, that, are you surprised by anything? I think, I think that was, that's the thing that, that, uh, you know, that, that we do take very seriously. I mean, Hugo plays the game just a crazy amount, uh, you know, all throughout, but, but particularly at the end, I play it a ton. We have, we have a lot of people, all of our designers are playing it a lot and, you know, that may go, that may seem obvious, but I, I do think the, the fact that we got to the end and those bold choices or those things that had been, you know, arguments or whatever throughout do turn into like, I'm addicted to this experience and we're about to, we're about to release this to the world. That that's where you do feel that, that confidence. And, and I think that happened for us where like even more so than doom 2016, which we loved, like we got to the end of this and, and literally couldn't stop playing it. Just, just wanted to, to play more and more and more. Um, well, that, and that, I, that feels great going into the launch. Well, I referenced Spider-Man as one of my examples uh, during development um, because I appreciated that I thought the game held me accountable early on. Like, look, in any, uh, I think... Uh, Very uh, accountable. <laughs> yeah, the, the um, p human beings are like, I, I think when it comes to learning new things, like kind of reluctant to learn them. I don't give a shit how disciplined you are. Like, I love video games and every time I start up a new one, <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty much, you have to force me to do your dive into your systems. Cause if you don't, I won't like if you give me one ability, you know, in Spider-Man, if the base combo that you teach me, and, and this is true of any character action game, uh, that we've, ex that we play is like, I will do that triangle, triangle, circle combo as until you tell me it won't work anymore. And you're not a great game if it works all the way till the end, like person, because then there's all this other progression stuff that I just won't dive into. You know? Oh yeah, no, I, you're right. That's, and I actually had a question relating to that. When you guys laid out Eternal, did you, or actually, did you lay it out from beginning to end and start planning your macro before you dived into, say, the mechanics or or prototyping levels? Say uh, say that again. Like, what is the question? So, so I'm asking more about the, your approach to macro design, and because you're referencing the importance of. Uh, difficulty ramps and making sure that the abilities that you have evolve into m more meaningful abilities later in the game. Mm -hmm. So what, what is your design approach to say a macro design? I think there's a, there's an overall feeling to, to the game. Like, like, uh, it's, it's kind of hard to explain. I, 
we almost start with the mic with the macro. We go back and forth and kind of let the game guide the process. Like if we we understand the basic elements that we're after of like push forward combat. Mm -hmm. And uh, we know that there are basic core principles to what we call the fun zone, you know, uh, a, a series of activities that we want the player to do and to master uh, in order to have fun. Pretty okay. much it's, it's weapon switching, it's glory killing, it's diving into lore. It's uh, it's really there's a uh, there's a list you know of of a group of things, and we use that as the guiding principle. Now those things, macro elements go in there. It wasn't like we started out development with the blood punch, for example, and said, "Listen, blood punch is part of the fun zone, and they need to do." We don't even know what blood punch is yet. You know what I mean? So, so they kind of go hand in hand. Where we know that there's kind of like a bink video or a or a little you know. YouTube video of someone playing the game in a way that we would say is quote unquote fun. And because it's a sequel, certainly that was already kind of worked out to some degree. Like we knew that weapon switching movement, aggress aggression being the solution to every problem, you know, uh, like all of those things make up a broad understanding of like the fun zone that we need to continue to have in order for our game to feel like a doom game. The, the the macro parts, the smaller parts, uh, also kind of get developed in the early part of the brainstorming session. So like you definitely, obviously, a game jam session, most studios have it, where we would allow for people to riff on things. And, and I think uh, as a studio, we tend to like almost not, you can, you can kind of uh, uh, stunt the development of the game if you try to work out the, the broad experience and the small experience all at the same time. Like you, every time somebody has an idea, you try to, well, it doesn't perfectly fit. Okay, we can't do that. You know, it, it's more like, dude, let's just make cool stuff. Let's, let's uh, what feels awesome? You know, what, what feels amazing? Dude, if we meat hooked and we swung around, this would feel sick. You know, a dash is nice. This blood punch, charge it up, bam. And constantly during those conversations, we're switching back from micro to macro, you know, like kind of big and small. Uh, how does that apply to the big the big picture? How does it feel as an individual mechanic? Can it fit into the overall fun formula? You know, uh, as we discuss DLC mechanics right now, we're constantly having that discussion. Does it feel good in the moment? And will it feel good in the overall uh, fun formula, you know, or as we call like the kill equation, like, like, what does it take me? I do X, Y, Z to kill a guy. You know, if that, if that kill equation is I, I shotgun, 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 then he's dead. That's, that's, that's not an awesome game, you know, like, uh, but if it's dash, you know, meat hook, shotgun, flamethrower, then dead, you know, or, you know, weak point, disable, he falters, that opens it up to a close range attack of the shotgun. I finish him off. I burn him. Then I finish him off with the blood punch. So I'm getting, he's not able to shoot me because he's faltering. He's burning and giving me resources. And then by the time he's able to even respond, he's dead. That's like a kill equation in Doom Eternal that's satisfying. Uh, what we try to get away from is the, the, the simple formulas because those aren't worth people's time. The, so what do I do is I shotgun him and then I shotgun him again and then he dies. You know, um, so, so yeah, it's, I guess it's bouncing back and all these answers are too long, uh, bouncing <laughs> back and forth from the big and the small, big and the small. And, and a lot of that was, a lot of that was informed by evaluating Doom 2016 and how players played that and, you know, and, and making that, that was a great foundation. Yeah. You know, it was, it was like, we were very proud of that game, but, but our goal was always to be able to build on, you know, kind of what, what we'd done there, um, you know, and, 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 and do better. And so evaluating and, and having that as our, our basis, which sometimes as, as Hugo noted, often uh, the, the kill equation for Doom 2016 was shotgun, shotgun, shotgun. And, and then, you know, we would see in reviews uh, or, or, you know, online commentary that, that, uh, you know, the game got tedious or boring or, uh, or less engaging. And then, uh, and that, and that drove a lot of the meta design uh, that, that the team did um, just to, just to kind of, Again, engagement was a big was a big word throughout development, um, and and that really building on top of of what we knew and what we learned from from building twenty sixteen. Well, I certainly hope combat designers out there are listening to this because I what you've described was fantastic. I, I love the terms you're using, and I love your method of thinking through it. It's great. 
the the macro part making sure that that is never harmed like our fun zone is like sacred and then we keep we keep the player inside that front zone by to be blunt just frustrating them like if they don't do what we want them to do we kill them or we hurt them you know or we limit their movement you know and so they they they, they ooh that didn't feel good let me go back to doing and and it and then by doing that they end up searching for oh blood punch you know diving into the smaller parts of the kill equation to get the desired result that we're after and and the bet is if you play this way you will have fun and you will love doom you know and then uh so frust- that's where frustration is tied directly into that because i think by nature i won't do something unless you make me do it and make me usually means uh you know discipline like forcing me to do it making me you know i i will i will uh I will avoid pain more than I'll seek pleasure. That's like, I think at a base level, human beings work that way. Like, you know, yes, I'm telling you, if it was a case of like, man, I'm telling you, the blood punch feels great. You'll love it. And I do it. I'm like, yeah, it does feel nice, but that's it. It's just a pleasure seeking mechanic, nothing else. I won't really use it. But if I don't use it, I'll experience pain in video games, the form of death, losing health, just frustration. God damn it. Why can't I do this? then you will do it. You'll, you'll be forced to do it. And so when ideally the, the loop is I'm avoiding pain, which pushes me into the micro mechanics. And then I'm, yes, I'm having fun. This feels really good. You know, um, I think well, that's certainly the- simplified things. I, I think that's great. I mean, it's a comp- obviously it's a complex formula, but you know, over laying over top of it is a pretty simple theory. And I, I think that's great. And it sounds like you know, you mentioned push forward, right? And your push forward approach. It sounds like that this, the push forward approach is directly connected to that, that mantra. Look, we, if, if the player, we need to make sure the players have incentive to use these mechanics. And I, and I want to ask about that push forward approach because uh, I can't remember any game over the past decade besides the last Doom that is so unapologetically unapolog- fast paced. And my, my impression for most other shooters is that they're moving in the opposite direction, right? I, every shooter I played for the last decade seems to be progressively slower in terms of movement, uh, enemy behavior, and the mechanics that can get you closer to enemies. You guys just throw that all out the window and just go for it. And were, did you ever have any debates about that? Or have you just grabbed onto that and said, this is our territory? I, Marty, I mean, it's yeah. been making that type of game for a while. I mean, you yeah, and I, talk I think about that's that just part time. of our part of our DNA. I mean, that, like, uh, you know, and and, and it, it really, I mean, as far as Doom and uh, Doom twenty sixteen and um, and Doom Eternal, you know that that was the de- that was the decision, kind of the defining decision um, in in the reboot was that uh, that we're not that we're not going to we're not going to follow, we're going to 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 lead and and be true to, to what doom is, which, you know, going all the way back to the originals, it is, it is a push forward experience, different mechanics pushing you forward, but, um, all of those kind of very simple, you know, no reload, very fast, um, carry all your guns, that, 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 that pace and that, that vibe of that experience was, was very much just what, what we, what we extracted those ingredients, um, for, for 2016. So, um, it, it was not a, it, one nice thing is it just allows us to, 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 to have our own lane, basically, you yeah. know, it's, it's, uh, both the, the gameplay style, the mechanics, um, you know, that, that push forward nature feels very doom. And it's, it's a very, if we do that at the highest level, um, it's a hard thing for a, another game to kind of step into our space and do it as well, because, because we really do try, you know, where, where a naughty dog, does cinematics at at just a a, a, a a level that you look at and you're like that's almost unapproachable, um, or you have to be damn good to to get there. We really try to do that combat and and that pace of of gameplay at that level where somebody looks at looks at our space and says, man, that's it's going to be hard to compete with Doom uh, when it comes to combat and feedback and and motion and flow, uh, and, and then also that extends to kind of what we try to do visually and with the personality of the game. Uh, just a- always really trying to define our own space and 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 own it and be the best at, at exactly what we do. I think that the uh, the the word consistency, you know, like clarity of of uh, 
of intent on uh, as a product. You could feel it, you know, like whether you pick up a Mac product or I play an Insomniac game. When I'm playing Ratchet and Clank, everything about Ratchet and Clank feels like Ratchet and Clank. Like yeah. every design decision, every scene, every character design, the UI, the music, like it's all so consistent. And it and I think the best uh, experiences feel that way. Uh, when Thanks things for get that. that's cool. Oh my god, I'm a huge fan. The <laughs> the the uh, when things uh, are at odds with itself, you know. Um, you could feel it, you know? So part of what makes the tone of the game work is because it's all in support of the same goal, which is to make the player feel strong and aggressive, even though, and, and it, we got another place there were, there's always a debate is, uh, early on, which is totally understandable is that what, what does it mean to feel powerful? Does it mean, Hey man, you're, I'm dying to these characters because I'm not playing you know, doing certain things, I don't feel strong. It's like, yeah, but you're going to feel strong when you master how to beat them, you know? Um, so the, whether it's push forward combat, the health that you get from those, uh, glory kills, uh, the chainsaw, the blood punch, you know, even just the way the guns are balanced, it's all just, and the cinematics and the way the Slayer acts and the music and everything, it's all just to, to try to reinforce uh, the main theme of the game, which is to, you should pick up Doom and feel like, man, I just feel like a badass. I mean, it you do all of this theory and, and analogies and all that stuff. I, I love I love being a creative person so much, a commercial artist, because it, it all just comes down to like, I just want to, I just want to see someone playing it and they say the words, God, I feel like a fucking badass. You're just like, dude, that's what it was all for. Like, that's it. You know, like I, and it, it's so the, the consumer is, is so honest in, in, in their assessment of things. Uh, and sometimes that could be brutal, but uh, when it's right and they, they basically, uh, we always say like in the pursuit of an emotional response, uh, some someone said about the the Mustang, uh, which I can't forget his name, but he was the project manager of the latest iteration of the Mustang. That uh, the the Mustang is a very emotional uh, purchase, buying a Mustang, because it's not a practical one. Because there's nothing practical about buying a gas guzzling eight cylinder engine car that uh, you can't fit anything in. You know why would people buy that? It's because it hits you in the chest. You know, and um, the best things do. You know. And and I, I I love that analogy. I lo I think that it's so such a great example of why being a commercial artist and a and a creative, whether it's making games or movies or whatever, is so satisfying because you'll hear it from the audience. You know, they'll they'll let you know right away, and it and it's kind of what what it what it's all for, to be honest. Well, one thing you one thing I'm I really enjoy hearing about is just the consist and, and experiencing is the consistency of the game, thematically, gameplay wise, art wise. And, and as, I think, as you pointed out, there is a consistency to all great games. I imagine that you, like us and, and other developers who have been around for several decades, have at least three generations of developers, right, as part of your staff. Given that generational differences can be pretty large, how do you get everybody on the same page? I think it's, uh, I mean, it's, 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 it's a lot of different things. I, I think when when we talk about transparency, that that's that's certainly one thing. Going back to kind of your original question about the team size and stuff like that, uh, I think that that helps. I mean, we are because we're small. There, there's there's not um, you know there's not a lot of people to to kind of fall through the cracks or or um, you know you can you can we can communicate with people pretty easily. We can get everybody into a theater. And have a, a, a you know one meeting and you know it's it's not a it's not a problem. So I think I think those types of things and and then the, you know some of the things that that Hugo's talked about where it's like um, you know defining the fun zone to, to you know drawing the engagement graph and and going through it with the team and uh, and ensuring that that people understand it and and reiterating it over and over and over. One of the big kind of one of the big tenets for us is is alignment. So we 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 try to do that on just, a, I mean, it's, it just takes, it's like, it's like coaching the football team to a certain extent, you know, you get out there and, you know, somebody, you know, somebody runs a wrong route, you, you, you try to correct, you know, constantly. And, and uh, it's, it, it just takes daily, um, you know, daily alignment, uh, whether that's in a meeting or a, a review or, or what have you. Um, 
you know, and then, and then clear direction. I think that's, that's one thing that Hugo's definitely, you know, you can, you can hear it in, in how he talks about the game and the design. And, and, uh, it's, it's not, uh, there, there's not, there's not generally a bunch of, of scattered, scattered ideas. There's, there's, there's good, clear, solid direction. It's communicated well. Uh, we're on the same page uh, about you know what we're making, how we're making, and why we're making it. We we really try to to make sure the team understands that constantly. That is an excellent mantra, and I, I know it's it's frustrating for team members when there isn't that strong direction, right? And and people are flip flopping and aren't sure what they're making. Um, but I will say that going back to the original Doom, you have absolutely established uh, a, a model for shooters that has been emulated and, and revered for so long. I will also uh, just kind of tongue in cheek mention that it's so cool that it is responsible for so many cliches in our industry. Um, <laughs> and I say that with love because I mean, where would we be without key cards or, or the rocket launcher shotgun pistol triumvirate, right? Or yeah. chainsaws, right? Those are the kinds of things that I think so many people forget were introduced by your games. And and Doom in particular, yeah, yeah, I agree. It's 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 fun. Those are the things that you know. Yeah, we we uh, when we say we've got a a strong legacy, I think everybody 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 feels it. And and it's it's honestly why a lot of people are at ID. You know, it's it's why they've come to ID. Um, you know, hopefully they stay there because they love they love the work and and they're they're as passionate about it as you know as as the next person next to them. But. Uh, but you know, it it is being in Texas. Hugo and I talk about it all the time. The recruiting, you know, re- recruiting people to 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 Dallas is different than recruiting them to L.A. or Hollywood, um, and and just the the pools of people. And, and it it would I think it would be much harder if if we weren't uh, it and and had some of that legacy because like you, you know, a lot of people in the industry are inspired by by the original work and and the the great work that guys like Romero and Carmack and Kevin and Adrian did. Um, and, and we just, we, we get to continue to, as long as we take care of it and, and continue to improve it, we get to, you know, we get to use it and, and, and bring people in because they want to, they want to work it in and, and be part of that. It's funny. You mentioned though, the recruiting part, are, are you suggesting that it's harder to recruit people to Texas than LA? I, I think it is. I, feel I mean, exactly I haven't opposite. recruited somebody to LA in a long time, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but there's, there's definitely, I, I think the. There's a there's certainly a wider talent pool I think in in uh, in LA just because of the the number of companies there. Yeah, but Ted, yeah, that is you, absolutely true. I mean, you the, feel like the, it's easier though, Ted, to, to to get to get people out to like Texas and Carol and the Carolinas. Yeah, we when we established our North Carolina branch, it was in in partially in reaction to the challenge we had bringing people to LA because of the taxes, hmm. the fear of uh, LA in general. Yeah, cost which of is, living, I'm sure. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's, it's hard. I mean, just financially, it's much more difficult uh, to live in LA. And I would say the same is probably true for San Francisco as well. So we, in some ways look on at Texas as with sort of envy. Um, (laughs) I mean, the weather's different, I suppose, but you have have no state taxes, right? And that's, that's pretty awesome. Real estate's cheaper. We anyway. we sent around a photo uh, recently because the devs are buying homes and starting their lives, you know, and it just feels so good to see, you know, for for that reason, you know. I, yeah. But I was super when you guys opened the, the Carolina studio. I'm like, oh man, that would be awesome because Rally is such a great place. Yeah. Uh, it's all you hear is good things. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I I hear good things that 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 studio, the location, and everything is really pretty awesome. Well, we're lucky. Yeah. It's, it's also nice that there are other development studios around as well. I mean, Epic obviously is one of the, is the giant in, in the area and, uh, but it's a, it's a beautiful community and we're, we're, we are very lucky to have a, a group out there. Um, yeah. We feel so really I, fortunate too, that we don't have to sacrifice. Uh, we, we, I say, we talk about that. I talk about that with the devs that like, it's hard to get all the categories feeling good. You know, if it was like a RPG, like that, all the stats are, are, are where they need to be, like in terms of like creatively satisfying job, like check, you know, um, cost of living and quality of life, check, you know, uh, good food, check, you know, like it, Texas or the Carolinas. Honestly, all of these cities outside of the, the major cities, you know, like uh, I, I, I want to go to where's that city in Tennessee, uh, Nashville. You know, everybody's talking about that. I would love to I would love to visit there. I hear it's awesome. So, um, 
yeah, it, it, it is, uh, we, we have so much going for us, uh, that we, it's, it's also motivating to, to do the right thing, not only for the brand and the fans, but for the studio, the team. I mean, we have a really good opportunity here, given that where the studio is located and the type of games that we get to make. And obviously there's an audience for it. So it, it's exciting. Well, you know, it's kind of, it's maybe ironic that we're, we're talking about our locations now, given that in our, in our current lives, most of us aren't even in the physical <laughs> location in yes. which we work. Right. Yeah. And is this uh, long term when you guys look towards how work is going to be done at id, do you see a change because of COVID? I, I don't think, I don't think so. Um, I, I mean, maybe, maybe small adjustments. Um, uh, but I, I, I do think we're, I mean, we've done a little bit, you know, we, we don't, it's not exactly like uh, the way Insomniac is, is kind of uh, LA and, and Raleigh. We have a uh, more of a technology centered group that is uh, that is in um, Frankfurt, Germany. Um, mm-hmm. And and we started that for, for probably much the same reasons you, you, you started up in, in Raleigh. Um, good, you know, good talent base and, and a, 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 it was easy to recruit there without needing to get people visas and that kind of thing um, for, for us on the international side. Um, but again, like we're, I think so much of our development is, is benefited by being in proximity to each other. Um, we've actually done much better than I expected in the work from home. I mean, the team has just clicked along, uh, just really, really well stayed, stayed incredibly productive. Um, and is, it is doing great work, but, um, I do think people feel the strain of, of not, you know, not having that connection as, as great as zoom or we use teams is. Um, it's, it's not the same to, to, you know, kind of be in the same room drawing on the whiteboard, um, you know, hands on the controller, everybody gathered around. Um, so I, I, I think probably little areas, um, that that we, we may be more flexible than we have been in the past. Um, but, uh, uh, but it's, it's hard to change the fundamentals of, of, you know, our culture in, in that way, maybe over the longer term now. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Well, hey, so I just I have a couple of couple of last questions for you. One's pretty goofy. Uh, why is Doom always capitalized? <laughs> That's a good question. It's it's funny. Uh, uh, you, we were on a Slack conversation just the other day where Hugo kept writing Doom with a capital D and small O O M, and and I think it was you. Some somebody on the marketing team which just kept correcting you. Please write Doom all caps. Oh, it was, it was our community manager Josh actually. <laughs> Um, that was, that was funny. Uh, I, it's bold. It's gotta be loud, you know? Yes. Yeah, like Jim. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that's a good explanation. It makes sense. I just, it just, when I find myself writing doom, I automatically write it in all caps. It's, I've been trained for yep. the last 27 years to do so. So, okay. Me too. <laughs> I, I, it's the same way with quake too, for me, like all of yeah. our, all of our games they're, they're other than like Wolfenstein, I guess, but they're, they're all just big, bold, all caps, you know, Doom, Quake, Quake Two, Rage. Uh, yep. I, I, it, it's it's rare we do a game that doesn't deserve all caps. I guess <laughs> that's such a great statement. I love <laughs> it. Okay, well, so uh, looking forward, right? We're we have two consoles launching this year. Cloud gaming is now a thing. Uh, PCs and graphics cards continue to get more powerful, despite the fact that they probably you know, we probably passed the physical limits a while back. I'm not an engineer, so I wouldn't even know, but <laughs> <laughs> what what gets you as players most excited about this next year? I personally um, that players are getting uh, their bar is 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 uh, they're getting more skillful. I think that there is a generation of kids, and I have them in my house. Uh, one of them was behind me a second ago. Where what Fortnite is asking kids to do, and the dexterity involved with playing that game. Uh, whether you're playing on mouse and keyboard or, or controllers and a lot of, but, but that I'll just call that game out in particular is uh, or, or I would say along with that, the broad acceptance of what was once considered more niche games, you know, uh, that are, uh, you know, maybe more challenging, but is, is, is amazing. Like, so that means they're taller. Basically it means that as developers, we can ask more of them, which is so exciting. You know um, I would, I would call it, Eternal is kind of like the opening moments is sort of teaching you how to play an instrument. And that, and that instrument is either if you have a controller in your hand or a keyboard and a mouse in your hand, you know, that's your instrument. We're going to teach you how to play it. And we start with some basic keys, 
you know, here's the chainsaw, here's the shotgun, here's how you weapon switch. These are weak points. You know, the, the plasma rifle's better against the shield guys. And each of those are like notes. And in the beginning, I want to make a meme of this for the team. Uh, cause in the beginning, it's like a kid with like an instructor over their shoulder, learning how to play the guitar. And then the, and that's what you are in the first couple levels. And then the last level, it's Eddie Van Halen sweating with his shirt off in the middle of a solo. You know, that, that's really when you watch our best players, uh, and what really, what everybody achieves a sense of when they get to the end, that's how you feel, you know, like what we're asking you to do with that, with that, uh, controller or with that keyboard and mouse. And um, we've got a whole generation of players who are like, bring it on, you know. And as a matter of fact, I think all gamers are like, if you're not bringing the heat with something, if you're not challenging me in some way, you know, give me something to master. As they say, I think Dr. Disrespect, when he, you know, a skill ceiling or like athletic, you know, like just a game that, and I don't even think that necessarily means that the game has to be blisteringly fast. You know, I, I think you could do it in a lot of different ways. But it, it just means that, uh, and then that coupled with the hardware and, and what we're able to do, all that coming together, which means that I don't, I don't think out of any studio you've seen their best game yet. You know, yeah. I, 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 Marty and I were talking yesterday, we haven't made our best Doom game yet. That, that's, that's for sure. And um, I don't think that's true of anybody, any studio. So that, that is so exciting as a gamer and as a developer. Yeah. That, and, and for me, it's, it's like, like all of that stuff that, you know, next gen, greater graphics, VR, all that, like there's always something, there's always something new. There has been, been in the industry more than 25 years or something. I don't know. That, like, like everybody, it, it, there's always something new. For me, the exciting thing is, is where we're at as a team. Um, it's, we've got gamers that, that, that Hugo talks about, but then as a team over the last, you know, I mean, since the inception of the company, but really, you know, since, since we started developing Doom 2016 and, and rebooted things and, and, and really kind of, kind of set our sights on, on what we were doing with the, with the company over the course of, of making Doom, um, it, it we, we said from the beginning, we wanted to, to build a great team as much as we wanted to build a great game because a great team can handle any of that stuff you talk about with, you know, with, with, with the best, uh, you know, with the best intent and, and with the best talent. Um, so we, we've really, I think as much as we've, we've honed doom and, and still have better in us, I think the same is true for the, for, for the team. We've just, we started a great foundation, had very little turnover on the team, you know, and I, I know you've probably experienced this as well. You just, you feel you feel so much more confident in what you can do with with all of that stuff that that comes ahead the great ideas the great hardware the new advancements when you have a team that has has worked together um is confident in itself confident in each other um and just clicking on all cylinders and hugo has said it many times in interviews great teams make great games and it's a, it's really something we believe in um and and it's the only way that we'll we'll get the most out of all of those all of those things is if the team can 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 you know continue to stay together and just and just build on success after success. I, uh, the Twitch stuff is so exciting, not only to get more people to see you know playing your game great, but like it's become aspirational. I mean, I, when you talk, you know, we we call them black belts, but like again, someone who has achieved a level of mastery in your game, you know, uh, and there are varying degrees of that, but like you get to watch them, you know do incredible stuff in Spider-Man, you know, or, or just shred and do maternal or, or do awesome stuff in some other game. And it, and it really shows just how far you could take that instrument, you know, like, holy cow. Like I, I find that when I watch people play and play well, I want to play that. I, like it makes me, it inspires me to go back to the game, you know, uh, whatever game it is I happen to be watching. So I think, or, or it sells the drama, you know, it, it's just such a great time to be playing games and making games. Uh, well, that's such a great awesome. analogy. You know, games being played like instruments. I've never heard that before, and but I think it's so true. Yeah, uh, I watch these kids. I tell Marty all the time. I'm like, dude, you got to watch this, and, and it is. It's like it's it's an eruption solo. It's Eddie Van Halen, and you're like, I didn't even know our game could do this. <laughs> you know, like, and we made the thing. So like, it's uh, and I see that all the time. You know, and um, with all games, so it's it's really exciting. Well, guys, thank you so much for being on the show. This is a lot of fun. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much for having us. Really appreciate it. It was nice talking to you. 
You too. Yeah, thank you again. Thank you for joining us for the Game Maker's Notebook. For more information on the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences, our podcasts, and our other initiatives, please visit www.interactive.org.